candidates for Jamestown Mayor. This debate will feature incumbent Mayor Abby Sunquist, who is running on the Democratic and Working Families lines. Kim Eklund is running on the Republican and Conservative lines. I'm Julia Cecil Hanley, the Public Affairs Director and Interim General Manager for WRFA. I'm being joined by media partners John Diagostino of the Jamestown Post Journal and Dunkirk Observer and Terry Frank of Media One Group's WJTN. This event is broadcasting live on 107.9 FM and streaming on WRFALP.com. You can also watch the live stream of this debate on YouTube.com slash WRFA Radio. WJTN and WRFA also will rebroadcast this debate at a later date. And the Jamestown Post Journal has been running over the course of this month a series of articles with questions and answers with candidates. Our panel will pose a series of questions to the candidates to discuss, and each candidate will have the opportunity to ask one question to the other. The candidates will be given two minutes for an opening statement. Afterward, they will have up to 60 seconds to respond to each question, along with 60 seconds for any rebuttals. If a candidate runs out of time, our official timekeeper, Gavin Paternitti, will notify the candidate with the following sound. <laughs> they will then have five seconds to wrap up, at which that time I will nicely cut them off. Also, you'll be notified when you have 30 seconds remaining on the clock with a sign. We've done a coin toss to determine the order for opening statements, and Eddie Sunquist will go first, followed by Kim Eklund, who will rotate the starting candidate for each question thereafter. So we will begin. Eddie Sunquist, you now have two minutes for your opening remarks. I have been honored to be the city's mayor for the past four years. When I took office, I never expected to take on a global pandemic. And the first two and a half years of my term were focused on the health of our community. Although we lost family, friends, and neighbors, we survived and became a more resilient community. And frankly, we were extremely limited in what we could accomplish during that time. Despite all of this, I am proud of what we've accomplished. Unemployment is the lowest it's been for three decades in the city of Jamestown. We've invested $8 million in federal funds directly into our neighborhoods. We funded a skilled trades program and put the city of Jamestown in a national spotlight with our workforce development initiatives. We've brought in $16 million in state and federal grants, and we've had the largest expansion of police and fire in decades, all with no tax increases. We did this by being flexible, by challenging the status quo and developing partnerships to solve our city's problems. You know, growing up in Jamestown, I was raised to bring everyone to the table to solve our challenges. And if it's not big enough, we build a bigger table. And that's what we did. We built a solid foundation and a team ready to move us into the future. But let me tell you what the next four years looks like. We're gonna focus on better housing for all. It's an essential piece of the puzzle that connects all the issues our community faces. It's time we start fighting blight on our streets through strategic demolition of dangerous homes. And I don't know about you, but I'm tired of being held hostage by absentee landlords. Now's the time to pass proactive legislation that focuses on basic health and safety standards. And more importantly, we need to protect our community by empowering our neighborhoods to rebuild our blocks together with public safety taking back our streets. Jamestown needs a mayor that cares about the quality of life for all residents, can make a plan, and execute on investing in housing, public safety, and infrastructure. This makes us a strong, thriving community ready for tomorrow's challenges. Thank you, Mayor Sunquist. Council Member at Large, Kim Eklund, you now have two minutes for your remarks. Thank you very much. First of all, thank you very much for hosting this debate, both to WRFA, the Post Journal, and Media One, and also to everyone who is here and also watching at home. Um, like Eddie, I do also take pride in my 20 years as a member of city council. I was moving back home and getting involved in the community, and I'm proud to say in the last 20 years I have worked bipartisan with many members throughout council to, for the betterment of Jamestown. We've focused on many issues. We have worked together through a pandemic. We have worked together through some very hard times in this community. We worked with uh, the former mayor in financial instability, um, always addressing the needs of the public first. Uh, what I, I want to mention about myself, why I'm here, uh, is not just because I'm on city council. I am a voice that has been around, knows the system a little bit, and feels that my next vision is to run for mayor, which is why I chose to run for mayor. 
I am a lifelong Jamestown resident. I was born and raised here. I moved back here after college for a job of which I have been in the same company for 34 years. The importance of that is the stability of that alone speaks volumes of my stability in this community and what I care about. Uh, personally speaking, I have been very specifically driven on city council and will continue to be as a mayor for the financial stability and the future of this community. Nothing can be done without financial stability. We can't have better housing, we can't have better public safety, and we can't have all of those things without it. it didn't, I didn't accomplish things on my own. I accomplished things with the work of the mayor, the administration, the staff these 20 years, and plan to do that going forward, addressing the needs of this community with people first. Thank you, Council Member Eklund. We'll move along to our first question. This is the only question provided to candidates ahead of time. A reminder that candidates have 60 seconds for initial response and 60 seconds for each rebuttal. <coughs> so the first question is, why are you running for mayor? And we will start with Mayor Sunquist. Thank you. You know, I want to be able to continue the great work we've started in the city and ensure that the city remains fiscally responsible, as Councilman Eklund had mentioned. I've been proud to have the largest fund balance in decades in this city, a low tax rate, and a sustainable budget for the future. I've worked with all of our unions, and we've settled every single union contract in my four years as mayor, some going back five to nine years. We've reduced our health care costs by reducing the budget by $2 million per year. We've brought in new revenues under EMS billing, and I've demonstrated leadership rooted in partnership. But more importantly, I love this job, and I love solving problems, big and small. Whether it's modernizing our city operations or helping our neighborhoods, that's why I ran for mayor, that's why I'm continuing to run for mayor. Thank you. Council Member Eklund. Well, thank you very much. Running for mayor is a personal endeavor that I have been fueled by my unwavering commitment to this community. I'm concerned about the community's progress and its prosperity. While we have delivered zero tax increases these last few budgets, we have increased spending over millions of dollars. I'm profoundly dedicated to fostering positive change, enhancing local infrastructure, and, propo and promoting sustainable economic growth. Jamestown and its rich heritage offers a unique canvas for the future and transformation. I'm passionate about it with the potential to create a city that thrives. The only way this city will thrive is not through a top-down leadership, it's through a bottom-up, and that involves the people. People are first, and that includes the staff and the employees at City Hall, as well as every union. Any rebuttals from either candidate? Thank you very much, Julie, and good to be with you and Jack here tonight at this debate. For the candidates, it was alluded to in the mayor's forum in the Post Journal recently about the mayor having outside work while he is considered a full-time mayor. He's also been criticized at least once for not being in the office as much as he should. To the mayor, are you devoting enough time to the job, number one? Mrs. Eklund, how would you be a full-time mayor? And I believe Mrs. Eklund goes first. Absolutely, thank you for that. Uh, it's a little different on council because it is a part-time job, so running for mayor would require me to leave my permanent full-time employer and dedicate my life and my service and that role as a full-time mayor. The charter states clearly that this is a full-time position. I will abide by the charter and I will serve full-time. And that doesn't necessarily mean eight to five. It may mean eight to 10 and then another afternoon and an evening shift. But regardless, it is a full-time position. I will not take outside work. Only work I will do will be volunteer. Mr. Sunquist. Thank you, Terry. You know, one of the things being mayor, as uh, Councilman Eklund pointed out, it's a 24-7 job. And as mayor, you need to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. Yes, I've been very open about having other positions, but my priorities as mayor comes first. Whether that's me going out to a murder call at two in the morning or a fire call on my birthday on New Year's Eve, right? I'm there for our community. But I also want to point out that there are many other leaders in our community that do hold other jobs, and ones that I work with often, such as Senator Borello and Assemblyman Goodell. Again, I've been open about this, and I've worked hard to make sure I am there every single time people need me. Thank you. Any rebuttals? <coughs> no? All right, John? 
Thank you. We're, as the Post Journal, we're glad to be here, part of this debate. It's important for the city. It's important for the residents. Thank you, Julia and Terry, for having me as well. Twelve buildings were identified as key parcels downtown in the Urban Design Plan 2.0, finalized in 2019. While a few of those buildings have seen new tenants or uses, little has happened with several, including the Furniture Mart building on 2nd Street, the former Viking building on Washington Street, the Key Bank building at Main and 2nd, the location at 10 to 12 West 2nd, storefronts in the Hotel Jamestown, a vacant space at 8 East 2nd Street. As the incumbent and a longtime council member, are you satisfied with the progress made in these buildings and locations over the last five years? If you win election, what will you do differently with these key parcels? And the question first goes to Mayor Sundquist. Thank you, Jack. I will first off say that you're absolutely right. When I took office back in 2020, we experienced a pandemic that halted all development in our city. And it was hard because we lost a lot of those contracts those developers had on those buildings. We have been in recovery mode ever since, and we've been scrambling to find new developers. But the reality is, is that the state provides different funding, the federal government provides different funding, and it's only now starting to turn in favor of the work we can do here in the city of Jamestown. But I'll tell you that I have been on the forefront of making sure we connect with our state and federal partners so that they are investing in the city of Jamestown. I can't speak for the prior administration or the last 20 years of development. I can only say that some of those deals were sloppy and they had investors, they had developers that couldn't hold their end of the bargain. Our goal is to make sure that we have developers that take those spaces and do exactly what they say they are going to do and us hold them accountable. Councilwoman Eckhart. So unlike the mayor, I will not blame the last 20 years. Hindsight's always 2020 and, and you know, it, I, I firmly believe that the council, whether I agreed with everybody or on the administration side made the best decisions with the knowledge they had at that time. Outside of that, yes, work needs to be done on those buildings. That and um, also without mentioning the brewery. We, we lost mm -hmm. that tenant in there, it sits empty. Um, what the magical answer is, I don't know. Like the mayor said, we went through some hard times economically and socially with a pandemic and that did not help. However, I feel that maybe the use that we originally intended six years ago needs to be revisited and, and looked at again, but we, they definitely need to be addressed before it's too late. Okay, any further comment? I'd like to go, please. Uh, I absolutely, uh, I absolutely, first off, want to say, you know, you don't have the, we don't have the magic answer, right? Councilman Eklund is absolutely right, but the reality is that the last 20 years have not worked, and so we need to make sure that we change, we, we rip up the status quo and start to look for developers and people that are going to hold them to their word. These were all deals that were done under Councilwoman Eklund's uh, leadership and council, but I'm not, I'm not faulting her for that because a lot of it has to do with the prior administration, but council has a role to play in this as well. Any further comment? The last 20 years also encompassed your four years, Mayor, so just understand that you also have been here for four years and we've seen that same lack. It, it, and for a lot of reasons, that's all I'm saying. Uh, for the next question, the city received nearly $29 million in American Rescue Plan funds as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. As nearly all of the funds have been allocated at this point to various programs and having each had a hand in how this funding was used, do you feel this funding was spent or utilized in the best way possible and what would you have done differently as in hindsight specifically? And we start with uh, Councilmember Eckhart. Just like I said earlier, hindsight's always 20-20. Um, transparency is key. Had we known some of the things we know today, two years ago, I don't think some of the decisions would have been made or maybe made a little differently, however the case may be. Um, as you can see in the last vote with the ARPA funding for the not-for-profits, there's concern with some of our own infrastructure being missed or overlooked or not addressed. That we felt, some council members, and I know I addressed it multiple times, we needed to take care a little bit more of our own. I don't I don't disparage any of the projects. They all pass, they move forward. I support them as a council member, but with only uh, 1.2 million and another 400,000 left to decide how to spend, we in a million dollar roof and a $7 million bond coming, I think there's definitely things we could have done differently, but 
I'm happy with what we've done so far. Okay. Mayor Sundler? I want to start off by saying when you compare us to other communities that have received this funding, we've actually spent down almost all of it, which is less than I can say for other communities. One of the things is that these funds were meant to be a shot in the arm for the recovery of the city of Jamestown. And that's why when we, st when we received these funds, we made this a community-driven process. We went out and we actually asked the community, how should we use these funds? How should we spend them? And we put together a master plan that was ultimately approved by city council. However, the council was just too slow to push out some of the programs. And at some point, we as an administration had to create these programs, push them out the door, and get them into the hands of our community. And we've invested a tremendous amount in the community. $8 million in our neighborhood, specifically $1.8 million alone for our senior citizens uh, to make sure that they're able to age in place and stay home. We've also invested in our infrastructure, as Councilman actually had mentioned. Either of you have a rebuttal? I do. Um, I don't think when you're talking about ARPA money and federal funding and what to do with it, um, your tax dollars coming back to your, into your community and as far as finance is concerned, people will criticize me till the day comes home. There's, there's no sense rushing a financial decision that impacts the future. So I don't think this council and I will stand up for them whether it's me or anyone else was too slow. I think they took their time to make, a, make sound good decisions. So I will defend the council for that um, and not just myself as the finance chair. On top of that, um, I just want to say real quickly that you just said we spent it in a record fashion, but then said we took too long to spend it. So I don't, there's, there's no easy answer, but we took too long to make some decisions. You are correct. And there were some things, Mayor, in your plan that you brought forward that we didn't approve, um, including you're saying you gave top funding to public safety. And in fact, most of those driven initiatives through ARPA were through this council. So we can debate that all day long. And Mayor, do you have a rebuttal? Yeah, you know, first and foremost, I have to respectfully disagree. When you are mayor, you have to execute on things, which means you have to move quickly and with a sense of urgency. You know, as council, their role is to be methodical and to be slow, but these funds were not meant to be slow. These funds were meant to get in the hands of people that need them, businesses that need them. And when I say that the council was slow, they were slow to approve programs and move things forward. You know, I want to make sure that we understand that these were an incredible, incredible opportunity for the city of Jamestown and has helped us recover as a community. Thank you. The city of Jamestown also owns the Board of Public Utilities. And with electrification coming to New York State, there's a good chance that the BPU's gas turbine will have to be phased out of use at some point. With the amount of additional revenue coming into the BPU from the turbine, it could leave the electric division to deal with a hole in its budget. That would also likely necessitate the needs for a need for a rate increase. What is your stand on electrification should it come to this? Is that with the mayor? Mayor Sundquist. All right. Since uh, you're president of the BPU, I'd like you to respond. Thank you, Terry. Uh, you know, first and foremost, we know this is coming, and I have actually been outspoken about the climate uh, leadership plan that the state has uh, proposed because although I support the work it's doing, it's coming too quickly and I don't think we'll be able to transition in the time that they're requiring. Uh, but more importantly, one of the things the city's doing is we recognize as a public utility that we will need to change. So what we're doing is we're working directly with the Department of Energy and the EPA, as well as NYSERDA, which is the state certifying agency, to figure out what's the plan. We're starting now with a study to figure out how do we create a just transition off of the use of our gas turbine? And how do we also fund individual households to move? Because that's the big question here, is how do we get individuals to move off of that without providing some type of incentive? And so I've pushed all along that the state needs to provide an incentive that we can pass on to homeowners to move away from fossil fuels. Councilwoman Eckling. A lot of what he says I agreed, unfortunately. I think at this point, even my conversations with some members of the BPU, including some members of the board, is. They don't even have an answer of how this is going to be implemented. The state has basically told us it has to be done in this time frame. I don't know how economically feasible it is even possible to have everything run electric, period. I, that's out of, I'm not an electrician and I don't claim to know that fame, but it just does not seem possible. 
um, while I applaud energy saving initiatives, they also have to be realistic and attainable. And at this point in time, I just don't I agree with the mayor. It, it, what has been put on us is just not necessarily attainable. Thank you. Any uh, rebuttals? I'm glad to hear you agree. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think there would be. Housing and homelessness are likely to continue to be issues for the next mayor and council. What, if anything, can the city do to increase the quantity of affordable housing for both renters and families looking to buy a house in the city? And in your view, is there more the city can do to help the homeless outside of the winter months? We'll begin with Councilwoman Eklund. Those are great questions and one, as I've been visiting door to door, is a great concern not only with residents with the increase in homelessness, but residents who have had to reach into their savings with the cost <coughs> of inflation and everything else, and who are feeling threatened maybe of possibly losing their home. Um, obviously some of those things we even as a mayor have little to no control over, but there are some things that um, ha we have recently approved that to brief it, the women's shelter that's going to be coming to fruition to help some of the homeless women. There are some great strides being made at the UCAN mission. I'm proud to see in their media blitz of people coming off the system, getting jobs and doing that. And I think we need to continue to address those needs of what that homelessness group is. Not everybody's homeless for the same reasons and try to figure out and work together as a community, both with religious, community-based, nonprofits and government to make that work, including the county and the state. Mayor Sundquist. You know, homelessness is an issue that, that popped up during, uh, right after the pandemic, and it's something that the city needed to address. You know, cities all across this nation have been overwhelmed, and I've talked to mayors in all different places. But you know, when we started to see it here in the city of Jamestown, no one did anything, but I did. I made sure that we brought together our faith-based groups and our resource providers and opened up emergency winter shelters, the first and only in Chautauqua County, we worked with the county, we worked with Joy Fellowship Church, we worked with MHA to open up these shelters, which were generally full during the winter months. But there's more work that needs to be done. We need a more temporary shelter that has to occur because we're already full at UCAN and others. And it's great the work that's happening right now to open up a women's shelter, but there's more that's needed. There shows a need for families, there's showing a need for women, and we need to do more as a city. So the, my goal is to continue to bring people together to help solve this crisis. Is there any further discussion on this? No, I don't think so. Okay, so the next question. Jamestown Community College has expressed a desire for the city to transfer Dietrich Stadium to the college to turn it into a multi-sport athletic complex. While terms of that transfer are still unknown, do you support the transfer? And what terms do you find acceptable for the transfer of the city facility? We'll start with Mayor Sunquist. Well, this is a fun question because I'm actively negotiating that. But uh, one of the things that we have to recognize is that the shelter cannot, excuse me, the stadium cannot stand the way it exists. Uh, it is continuing to cost more and more money. Uh, and so we'll have to be redeveloped. And whether that's the city doing it, whether that's JCC, that's yet to be seen. Um, I am supportive of us renovating and changing that stadium. And if we can work in agreement with JCC, we will, uh, because it is a good partner. But the reality is, is we haven't seen that yet. We haven't negotiated a deal for that stadium yet. And we haven't seen the money materialize for that stadium yet. And my response has always been, I will certainly support it, but you gotta show me the money. Because I can't just go on a handshake and say, this looks great. Show me where you're gonna get the $30 million first, and then we'll talk about actually making the deal. Okay, Council Member Eklund. Um, as most people know, I'm very, very active proponent of youth sports and the use of the stadium in my role, especially as the Babers World Series Vice President. However, there's two things that, that come right off the plate outside of the money is um, park alienation law. That is something in New York State, and the first step to even negotiate that would be to get that resolved. And those that don't know that, for every park that city or state owns, it has to be replaced with the same equal value and the same equal um, space. So even though it's a government entity to a government entity, that still needs to be approved. So before any steps can be done, that to me should be primary. And then determine whether you get the money. We do need to upgrade that stadium. We do need to make some changes to it. But I don't see a reason why the city can't take the initiative and pull in a partner with JCC going the other way as well. Any further comments? 
Uh, yes, just a quick rebuttal. Um, thank you, Councilman Eklund. This is the first I've heard that you're interested in the city trying to work through this. Uh, and if there's any suggestions, we'll certainly take them. But I will have to say respectfully that you're incorrect about the park alienation law. As an attorney, we've gone through this and we're working directly with the Parks Department, this New York State Parks uh, uh, Department, to try to figure this out. Because if you do give it to another government entity and the use remains the same, there is an, and there is an exception and an exemption. So I wanna be very clear about that. But one thing is correct, which is there is a process uh, to this. And we'll have to follow that process. And as I said before, until I see the money for it, there's no sense in even talking about it. Council Member uh, Well, uh, why I am maybe wrong in a technical lawyer term, I'm not wrong. That process, whether it's the Parks Department that approves the alienation or not, but also in that plan, I'm watching out for the taxpayers because that initial plan came down with us funding labor there. And I don't think that's a win-win for the city. Um, we do have time for an additional question, and uh, I'm actually, I think I'm gonna use a question that Terry Frank had, um, if you are okay with Go me right doing. right ahead. So this is on <laughs> the, the 2024 budget. So salaries are increasing in the 2024 budget at pretty much for everyone in city government, not just labor unions. Once the state and federal grant money runs its course, does that set up the city for fiscal problems in the future? We'll start with Council Member Eklund. Um, absolutely. Uh, you know, I haven't had a chance to divulge into the deep realms of the budget because the book we are provided is, although it has some detail, it's not the detail that a finance committee and someone with a financial background looks for. So I look for more details. So my concern has always been about this budget. Why it's a zero tax increase is a great thing, but it's a spend increase of 1.2 million and a revenue increase as well of over a million. That to me, until I get into the details is concerning. And going forward, if we don't have financial stability and can pay the salaries and raise the revenue and all those things, revenue and ultimately comes from not only the state, it comes from our tax dollars, bottom line, whether it comes from the state or local. So um, I am concerned about the end of, there's some things in the budget, including an increase in uh, revenue stream for interest off of money we have in the bank from the ARPA plan. And, you know, other things. So yes, I'm very concerned. Mayor Sanchez? You know, I've been proud to produce the 2024 executive budget, uh, which in the first time in many years is a balanced budget with no tax increase. We've had zero tax increases the last four years. But more importantly, this budget has something that we're very proud of and something that I hear time and time again, which is removing blighted homes from our community. We funded this budget at half a million dollars in demolition costs. We put $200,000 in sidewalk repair so that our pedestrians can walk across our city. We've increased, excuse me, we've maintained levels for public safety through here so that we have an increased staffing for police and fire. And certainly there is a concern what happens when we are out of funding, but at the same time, we've been increasing revenues, which make up for the loss of funding that we are have in a few more years. I wanna just point out here that this is a really great budget and an opportunity to transform the city of Jamestown with the work we do. Councilmember, do you have a, have a rebuttal? I, 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 not necessarily a rebuttal, but it's some comments. Mayor, I appreciate the fact that you have worked very hard to deliver a no tax increase budget, but to, in all fairness, this council, the last two years and your th first year in office, has come forward with anywhere from 15 to 26 resolutions to adjust those budgets and including things in there that should have been negotiated as well as um, salaries missing. It doesn't matter, I'm not, whatever. But the point is, it, it, it isn't, you've delivered that, but it's now the council's job, whether I'm there or not, to go through that and make sure that maybe zero isn't enough. Maybe it's, maybe it's a tax reduction and maybe there's some more things we can do. Mayor? I do have a rebuttal, yes. You know, absolutely, we've been working very hard to provide that information and do the budgets. You know, we've uh, kept taxes low while uh, everything else has increased, right? Councilman Eklund had mentioned inflation has hit everyone's pocketbook. We've kept spending low below inflation. And I certainly recommend, I certainly agree with the idea of a tax cut, especially Councilman Eklund, since you voted to increase taxes in the city 10 out of your last 20 years. So sure. certainly that would be a good thing to deliver. Uh, we do have uh, time for more questions, so John, I'll let you ask your question. So one of the most talked about topics in the city in the recent months has been the SAFER Act. 
Uh, there's big concerns financially regarding that, just moving forward in the future. Talk a little bit about how that's going to be funded once the grant runs out. And we'll begin with Mayor Sunquist. Well, I've been proud to secure the $2 million in the Safer Grant funding that helped us get eight new firefighters for the city of Jamestown. It is a huge undertaking to get that. We had to work with the unions, work with national organizations, work with FEMA in order to make it happen. And as we went through that process, there was a point where it seemed like the council was gonna send that money back to DC with a, with a note saying we don't want it, right? But I'm glad that they've come to their senses and they have accepted that. But SAFER Act is, provides fully funding for our firefighters for three years. Obviously, there is some concern over those three years. We're able to reapply, but we've also raised revenue along the way. We're bringing in a second ambulance. Revenues themselves for EMS services have gone up tremendously over the years and will continue to do so. So we're working through that process, but more importantly, we're gonna have eight new firefighters, which means every single station in the city of Jamestown, every single fire station will be open for the first time in decades. Councilwoman Eklund. Thank you very much. I, I heartily disagree with the mayor that this council was not dedicated and willing to just free willy send the money back. Again, with due diligence, there were concerns raised about the financial stability going forward. Even in this first year, it's costing over what was allocated per year in the SAFER Act. So to make up that 150,000 to whatever that number was, needed to be discussed and reviewed by this council. In addition, there's contractual agreements with the department that needed to be looked at and met and make sure that the city and the taxpayers would be held harmless in that. That is the council's job. That's what the council succeeded in do, doing. There's not one council member, including myself, who does not support and wish we could fuel more employees citywide. We have 15 parks employees and more and more parkland every day. We haven't added them. If there was a grant for them, we'd do the same thing. It's about doing what's responsible and doing what is covered for everybody, and that's the taxpayers that reside in this city. Any further comment by the mayor? Yeah, I'll just add that uh, we did put in new parks laborers into this year's budget, so I hope that stays in. Uh, but you know, certainly, uh, with the due diligence did happen by city council, and we got the bill today, and that cost the taxpayers $21,000 uh, in order to write up an agreement between the firefighters and the city. So when you say we've overspent, yeah, we have. Councilwoman Eklund? We spent 21000 to protect hundreds of thousands of dollars down the road in layoffs and unemployment. So if that's what we need to do to protect the city and taxpayer in, up front, that's what we do. There aren't many things in his budget that are not overspent. So I do have a question for the mayor. He, he addressed EMS revenues going forward. He said they're up tremendously. Can you tell us what those revenues are compared to the expenses? Uh, I don't have the up-to-date current revenue as of today, uh, but certainly we've spent, we've received over $300,000 this year alone in EMS, EMS revenues with the addition of a, an ambulance. I think we were, we projected well over $500,000 in revenue uh, for the 2024 fiscal year. Any comment? Nope, the revenue, I wanna thank the council. They're the ones who put the, uh, the ambulance in the ARPA plan and, and, and supported the fire department for the ambulance. It was not in the mayor's ar initial ARPA plan. Thank you, and we'll go Terry and Frank, uh, do you have a question for us? Yes, I do. I wanted to divert away from the budget uh, because Jack brought it up earlier about what was going on with the urban design plan and those 12 buildings that were brought up. In the next four years, the mayor may be having to consider a new comprehensive plan mm -hmm. for the city. And I wanted to get your takes on it, and I'm not sure who. With, uh, Councilman Start Eklund. with uh, Kim Eklund. Do, do you think there needs to be a new comprehensive plan? I do. Unfortunately, as we've seen with the pandemic and with other things and, and inflation and everything else, I think the rules of what could have happened 15 years ago, including bringing in a 300-person um, economic development manufacturer, isn't feasible in New York State anymore and not to the fault of the mayor of the city. It's just New York State. And maybe we need to look at the comprehensive plan overall of how to bring in small manufacturers, technology, things that, that can house 50 employee persons and maybe have 10 of them, whatever the case may be. We also need to revisit what's happening downtown. We, with, with the pandemic quickly came hybrid work. 
We don't have the traffic downtown we have downtown. How do we get it back downtown? Do we, do we change that? So I think we need to look at overall what the future holds for this city and what, honestly, what the residents want. Mayor, your thoughts about a comprehensive plan? I'm certainly glad you brought it up since we got the funding for one. Uh, you know, comprehensive plans really should be done at least every 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and the city, it's been a long time since the city has done one. Uh, so we went out, we secured funding from the state for not, not only a comprehensive plan, but also zoning. Zoning laws which haven't changed since the 1960s here in the city of Jamestown. Uh, things have changed a little bit along the way. Uh, so it's time that we update both of those, which is a very community-driven process uh, where we bring in a lot of different members of the community to help us better understand what should we have in our neighborhoods and where should the city go in a strategic plan. Any rebuttals? No, I, that's, <laughs> All right, um, and we are running well on time because that's you guys are not as chatty as we thought. So uh, one of my questions would be, um, and I guess this is maybe a self-serving kind of question from my past, but uh, we've mentioned how that the parks uh, have been, you know, become bigger in the city of Jamestown over the years, and that there are 15 parks laborers, and that there's two more added in this budget. But uh, what are your, um, what's your vision for the parks in the city? going forward, and I think we're starting with Mayor Sunkist on this one. So we've been, we've been really focused on expanding parks uh, the last uh, four years, especially coming out of the pandemic. If anything, we found that uh, parks were a haven for people, and we wanna make sure that the neighborhood parks are, are gonna be the best that they can be. This is where our kids go, this is where our people congregate, this is where you have your birthday parties, your graduation parties. So we wanna make sure that we have a strong parks department. As you mentioned, uh, we have a great parks department first and foremost, but we do want to expand it. We have over 500 acres of parkland in the city of Jamestown, but we've done a lot of really incredible things along the way. We have for the first time two splash pads coming next year, one at Jackson Taylor and one at Allen Park. We have a new playground coming at Willard, uh, Willard Park, uh, which has been pretty vacant and a problem for many years. And uh, other parks are receiving pickleball courts and other improvements. Uh, it's our way to expand our parks and our way to make the quality of life as residents more attractive to being here in the city of Jamestown. Thanks. Councilman Reckland? Uh, I, I agree with the mayor that the parks are a very vital piece of this community, Julia. As you know, my father retired from the parks department, so I've had a long withstanding interest in the parks. Um, to me, we have done some park expansion, but there's another case of things that we have to address, and that is park maintenance. Um, We've expanded the use of a great thing in the parks, and that is Frisbee golf, up and coming sport. So to see better utilization of the space that we have is very good, including future of pickleball as addressed in the ARPA and other plans at Roseland. I think that's vital, but again, like we have infrastructure needs as well as the park, I would love to see more parks, but with 15 guys today, they're having a hard time between the river walk and every park space in Jamestown maintaining it as it is. Uh, do you have a rebuttal or further comments? Uh, no, just uh, I'm glad to, um, hopefully we get those additional parks workers because they're desperately needed based on this conversation. Councilmember Eklund, any other comments? No. Nope. Okay. Um, do you have a question, John, that you would like to ask? We can move forward. We can move forward? We're good, Mary? Anything else? All right. So we will um, move to the next topic, which is candidate questions. So this is where each candidate will have an opportunity to pose one question to her opponent. The opponent will be given 90 seconds to respond. The mm -hmm. questioner has up to 60 seconds for rebuttal, and the opponent will have 30 seconds for a final rebuttal. And I have down that we, uh, well, we, we kind of mo moved around here. I think we start with Council Member Eklund for sure. this one. So the, obviously my question is going to be financial driven, Mayor, as you know. Um, while you made a comment that I um, voted no in 10 previous budgets, put it in perspective, I, I might have voted no for various reasons and I honestly can't remember exactly why, but I'm sure they were viable. Um, but what I wanna ask you, and I've said it at council meetings many times, I'm concerned about the five-year financial plan of the city. You have increased spending in your budget 1.2, whether it's viable or necessary or not is yet to be determined because we, as a, I, I haven't personally dug into it or has the council. Um, I wanna know what is your true financial plan for the financial stability and the five-year plan can't continue to increase a million and a million spend year over year. 
and please don't reference the mess you left in uh, that was there in 2020 because that's an insult both to the council that served in the administration at that time as well as the staff and employees. Different time, different economics. So one of the, the question is, what is the five-year plan? Is that correct? Yeah. Right. What is your financial Fi goal? Financial goal. Well, the financial goal, first and foremost, was to make sure that the city is on solid financial footing. Because when we did come in in 2020, there were issues, right? And so what we did in 2020 and then 2021 was we did, we settled every single union contract, which was going back at that point four to five years, where our firefighters and police officers had not been paid, we had not budgeted for it, and we had left that alone. We then went out and we made sure that we continue to uh, make sure that we are developing properties, that we're assessing them properly. And along the way, we wanted to make sure that uh, we were being good stewards of funds. So when you ask, what's the five-year financial plan? We're in a lot different place than we were when I started. Uh, so right now, we're in a good spot. We have the largest fund balance that we've had in decades. We have not touched it any of the years I've been in office, even though we've budgeted for it. And going forward, we have a balanced budget, which means we won't be touching that fund, and we have it in case that there are issues. I'll also note that we came out of the fiscal stress score from the comptroller's office in 2022, under my administration. We were under stress, uh, or considered under stress, for many years until 2022 when we finally came out of it. So when we ask for the five-year plan, well, the city council hasn't passed a plan in, for a five-year financial uh, goal, but our goal is to continue that success in economic development as we continue to raise revenue and decrease costs. for a rebuttal 60 seconds my head is actually kind of spinning right now because this this what I'm asking for is what are we going to deliver to the taxpayers and, and and you're talking about what we've done while I honor and appreciate what we've done it doesn't address the future and the future is how are we going to handle all these expenses and all these employees we've hired while I support the hiring of employees going down the road when the ARPA funds end and the projects end and all the maintenance with all the things we've added, including splash pads, including things that I voted yes for and believe in, how are we going to pay for them down the road with all the other? And to say you settled contracts, I respect that, I appreciate that, but to say that we didn't budget for it is, is an incorrect statement. The former administration always had the money somewhere and usually generally, just so everyone knows, being up for it in total transparency and honesty in the healthcare line to anticipate the anticipated contractual obligations that may come to fruition. Yeah, you know, first off, I want to say that uh, I, I'm not a fan of hiding that funding, right? And that's why we haven't done that. Uh, that's why we've tried to be very clear about where our funding is going and, and how it is going out. Uh, but, you know, one of the things that we have done and continue to do for the next five years is you're right, services have to increase, but residents are asking for services. Mm -hmm. So it's either you raise taxes or you cut expenses or you find grant funding. Well, I went out and got $16 million worth of grant funding last year alone, which has helped reduce our costs and keep our taxes low. Okay. Uh, Mayor Sunquist is now you have your opportunity to ask uh, your question. Uh, Councilwoman Ecklins, uh, obviously I've been, been mayor for four years and a lot has changed along the way mm -hmm. uh, in both in the world and in the city. Uh, we've saw an increase of homelessness, we've seen uh, an increase of crime, mm -hmm. we've seen issues uh, with uh, you know, unprecedented federal funding coming our way. Um, all of those things are things that need to be addressed in the city. Mm -hmm. uh, so my question to you is if you could please tell me what legislation you have written, sponsored, and got passed that has addressed those issues or helped the residents of the city of Jamestown? Well, first of all, there's a difference between an executive role and a legislative role. The council serves as a legislative body, not as an executive body. While I have not personally written any on the state level, Mayor, I have worked side by side with Mayor Teresi and you to try to do what's best in the legislation presented to us to protect the residents and the community of the city. So me personally writing legislation, no, Mayor, I don't feel that that's my role as a council member, but to help sponsor those legislations that we worked on a unified body or with the administration through the years, absolutely glad to be a partner in. 
Uh, do you have a rebuttal? I do have a rebuttal. You know, I, I certainly appreciate that, Councilman Eklund, uh, but your, your role as a legislator is to pass policy, is to pass legislation on the citywide level. You know, I've been mayor four years, and I've heard a lot of no's, and I have concerns from you, uh, but I have not seen a lot of you working with our administration to address these issues. But I have to say, your other council members have, right? I've worked with Bill Reynolds, I've worked with Jeff Russell, I've worked with Brent Sheldon to pass legislation and change the city's finances. Uh, but all I get from you is usually criticism and concern. And you just sat here, you passed no legislation. Okay. You have 30 seconds to respond to that. Mayor, I've served as a finance chair under your term. I certainly have disagreed with many things you have said, but I've also supported anything. And, and please don't say that you've gotten along with all of them, because all of them, we all know, have had our head to head. And regardless, that's sometimes said behind closed doors, not publicly, um, because we all agree to disagree at times. However, um, it's insulting to me that you would say that because you preach transparency and how many times have we found out things through the media and not through you. Okay. All right, thank you. So we are now to our closing statements. Uh, each candidate will have two minutes for their remarks and we will start as uh, we are flipping from what we started with. Uh, Council Member Eklund, you will start first with your remarks. Thank you very much. Again, thank you very much for the outlet in, in an effort to debate. It's really hard to, to discuss the key issues and, and again, um, I made a promise to Eddie when I first ran that I would not be personal, and I still made that promise. I may agree to disagree with him, and I respect his opinions, and I respect that out of him and his campaign, and I appreciate that. Um, my role, I have spent a lot of time going door to door. I have spent a lot of time with some table talk. I have spent a lot of time with the residents. I haven't run a social media platform. I haven't run a press release platform, because to me, it's people over politics. That has been my statement since day one. It's about the people. The only way this community is going to move forward with a leader who is transparent, honest, and can lead the ship is involving the community. It's not a top-down approach. It's not me coming in and saying, I, I, I. It's we, we, we. We have to work together for what the residents want, and the residents have to feel part of it, or the ship is not going to stay afloat, period. Coupled with that is the economic stability. I have made that my honest platform. I, like Eddie, I'm very concerned about the housing stock. We have to look at different initiatives. We have to look at different things in using, work with the state, with the state leaders, with our county leaders, get some state laws changed, which I know is in process for the frontage of building smaller homes. We have to look at different avenues of doing things. Business is not the same as it was when I first ran 20 years. Business is different. And we have to look at ways of doing things different. And I appreciate my door-to-door my -door activity. I appreciate the process of running for office because it isn't always easy. And I appreciate the people who have come out to support me along the way and offer insight. And I appreciate the opportunity to run against the mayor. Mayor Sundquist, you have your two minutes for your closing remarks. Well, I certainly appreciate the idea of people over politics. It's something that I live each and every day working with our residents and our constituents. You know, when I took office, I promised to shake up the status quo, and I've been doing just that. My administration has a sense of urgency in getting things done, and despite the obstacles in our way, we haven't stopped progress. You know, I've been flexible, working with a Republican council all four years as mayor. But you know what? I'm a voter too, and I've yet to hear a plan from the Eklund administration, because it's especially concerning since she said she's been there 20 years in government. Being mayor means having a plan, taking all viewpoints into account, and executing that plan for the good of all residents. I can only say that I have a lot of unfinished business to help grow our city and have the plan to move it into the future. And I don't know about Councilwoman Eklund, but the next four years, I will continue to fight tirelessly for everyone in our city, bring everyone to the table, and keep rebuilding the city that I am proud to call home. Thank you. Okay. I want to thank our candidates for participating in tonight's debate. Also, thank you to our audience here in person and online and listening on the radio. You will be able to hear this presentation online at WRFALP.com as well as view it on YouTube.com slash WRFA radio and hear rebroadcasts on WJTN as well as WRFA. On behalf of our media partners, 
Jerry Frank and John D. Agostino, as well as Cranky Plane Productions, Joe Patrol, Zach Stullsmith, and Gavin Pedernitti, and Abby Monahan, as well as the entire Reg A team. Thank you for being with us tonight, and good night. <laughs>